Uh, you start talking about Man City, and I think this is a good way for us to... Um, <laughs> to get into the actual topic. To get into the actual topic, <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, where we, I've watched the Man City... Um, what is it called? It's All or Nothing. All or Nothing documentary so those on Amazon Prime. Yeah. And then, um, I don't know, when you've seen the Sunderland Till I Die in Netflix documentary. I've seen bits and pieces. I haven't watched too much of it. If you, if any viewers or listeners haven't um, heard it or listened to it, uh, oh, sorry, viewed it, I should say, um, go watch the Sunderland one because the shit, shit housery, show. The shit housery <laughs> that goes on in there is absolutely hilarious. You, you you see how not to run a club basically you've you they used to have a um uh, an owner that basically lived out in america somewhere or still lives out in america but back when he owned sunderland he used to just be so um disconnected with the club that the club would just do something not really consult the financial department and just send the check over to the um, to the owner, the owner would just sign it off, and then that's where the shit started because no one was really looking at what they were spending. It was just like, oh, we need this, okay, and then that's it. You go sign it, we buy it. Right. So, you, the mess they got themselves into, um, really sad, really. What, 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 what did they get themselves into? Because I'm so, struggling to. Remember. So they had a uh, cryotherapy room, which okay. um, cost them, I think, eighty thousand pounds a month. But right. This is just one example of what was going on. Um, no player had used it. They didn't know how to use it, so it was just there, and they were paying eighty thousand pounds a month. Right. Um, and the new owners, eventually, when you look through this documentary, there's a few spoilers. Um, I, I have to say them. Yeah, yeah. There's a new owner that's come in, and of course, when the documentary was showing, he was, you know, really cutting back on costs and all that. Mm. Now he's wanting to sell them because he's realised how awful the culture in the club is. It can't really change as quickly as he thought. Mm. So he came in and he said, well, why have we got this cryotherapy room? Who's using it? What players are using it? And it came became quite apparent that only one player was using it, and that was a um, player that was only really using it once every few months when he felt like it. So to run it for, for one player who <laughs> used it when he felt like it without a proper sports <laughs> science department running it, it's just a shit house. And you, you watch it, and they went through um, one chief executive um, looking after, which he couldn't really manage anyone. And then the new owner came in, so he brought his people in. Um, and uh, it, it helped steady the boat a little bit, but then with their culture, they went straight away. And when they went, oh, well, we're running things our way, you're going to listen. And that's where they started losing a bit of the employees, like the marketing manager. Um, so you could see that they've had a bit of friction there, and just how they want things run. It wasn't a very nice environment to be in. You wouldn't want to work for those managers personally, or how they were treating their staff. Mm. So you watch that and you and you think, oh, okay. Well, they, you know, they're, they're only a Premier League club a year ago, two years yeah. ago. So on the field, they must do the job. And of course, when they got relegated from the Premier League, with they thought, right, come on, we need to get back in it. They got relegated again into Le- into um, League, League One. One from the Championship. So just a massive shit show and of course then you just see the misery of the fans and all you've got to do is, is laugh like it, it's sad but not being not being a Sunderland fan all mm. you've got to do is laugh and I'm sure Newcastle fans love that documentary so much because I know there's chants on um, when they're played against each other saying oh we saw you cry on Netflix and <laughs> all that stuff which is really funny <laughs> but you, you watch it and it's again it's it, the misery of the fans and you know they still have hope they go to Wembley when they get into the playoff final and they lose that game it's mm. like well they get nothing their way mm. which is horrendous really but if you um, like football and you like a bit of drama definitely watch that documentary if you haven't mate it's so funny um, but you, you have to really feel for the fans and then you contrast that with the Man City all or nothing documentary which is so well run like the club appears but to be fair it doesn't show too much of the behind the behind the scenes stuff it mostly shows pep coaching mm-hmm. and like the the games that they you can tell he because, loves it though doesn't he where yeah. he's standing there and he sees the camera and he's like oh yeah I could do this and do that and <laughs> yeah. you go on over here and it's like pep are, are you like that off camera it true yeah yeah you do want i i he can't be like that all the time no no you you feel like it's put on a little bit, mm-hmm. but um, you you can you you see that it's really well run behind the scenes the club, 
and the fact that they they were on it, they already had players that they want. To be fair, finances is a big part of it. They've got so much money that they can just chuck at it, and they know that they'll be okay. Whereas these teams like Sunderland, they're they're kind of living month to month pretty much. And you've also got to consider the fact that you know now with COVID, it's kind of exposed a lot of those flaws in football, where we're seeing something like seventy percent of clubs are now really struggling financially because they can't play games and they can't m- earn much money. From gate revenue, you mean? Yeah, from People ticket sales and from sh- some shirt sales and things. Like all the, all their revenues just gone down, yeah. massively down. And they, and you know, Man City are one of those clubs that will forever be fine with with the current owners that they have so they know that they can splash out on players and coaches and facilities whereas teams like Sunderland can't do that because they're okay to be fair they did spend 80 grand a month on cryotherapy chambers or whatever but they didn't have people to run them no and that's the awful thing because you don't have the hierarchy where you know who's the leader and you know who's to look to and you know who is talking about what you they should be talking about and not flipping a room that stands in the corner and you think oh nothing to do with me so I'm not going to deal with it mm. I feel like that was quite a lot of Sunderland where they were almost fed up of oh, I don't know if it's that losing culture that they had going on but it, it did clearly hit a spot with them where they didn't care and I don't know what it is I, I only seen what was shown in the documentary and of course that's chosen to be shown what the Netflix producers want to be shown mm. so of course there's a lot of drama in that um, but with Man City, I think they're in a they're a case that's exceptional. I, I think with how much money they apply, when no football club's doing that right now, mm. they um, if you've been living in a, under a rock or in a bubble, they have been miraculously unbanned after spending too much money um, and only been made to pay ten million when they're not guilty. Somehow they still owe ten million exactly. to UEFA. Um, so anyway, without going too much into that before I set off. It's, it's one of those things where they plough money into the women's teams and they say, oh, well, it's, um, it's sponsors and all that. And, of course, where their sponsor owns their um, them and the sponsor, I think it's Etihad, isn't Etihad it? Etihad Airways, um, yeah. yeah they, Which they is owned own, by the, ro- the same royal family that owns Man City. You, you can play around with money. And then again, when you've got enough money, you can play around with it even more by paying UA for 10 million when they find out that you've done something wrong. <laughs> exactly. So all in all, I think they're an exceptional case in that scenario where the Pep Guardiola spent half a tr- uh, billion on defenders now. He, they're, they're buying Ake, was it 507 million the last however many years Pep spent. And they mm. still lose 10, 11 games a season. So when you think Chelsea's defence is bad, there's also Man City. <laughs> True. I w- one one thing that I found quite funny from ye- like genuinely funny from yesterday was seeing your face every time the ball went anywhere near your defence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Instantly shit yourself. But it, it, all, all the fans are saying, "Oh yeah, Kepa shit." Yeah, his stats are shit. But then again, when you have wooden sticks standing in front of you defending the ball, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, you can't do much. Exactly, it's it's ridiculous. You know, obviously, the keep the one job the keeper has is to actually move to try and save the ball. And there was a stat I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's something like thirty percent of the goals that Kepa conceded were because he just didn't move. Yeah. <laughs> and he conceded against like fifty-five percent of the shots that were taken against him. Yeah. So. So every other shot basically you take against them, you will score. Yeah, pretty much. So it's worth your while just <laughs> whacking it and hope for the best. Yeah. But um, you know, Man City, these, th- they they just have so much money, and they they established a clear um, authority and winning mindset, which teams like Sunderland just don't have. They seem to be all over the place. No one seems to want to be there really, which is sad. In Sunderland. Yeah, in Sunderland. No one wants to be in Sunderland. I mean, it's not a part of the world you want to be in. Full <laughs> stop, <laughs> is it? <laughs> but you would, but you would want to go there if they were winning. But no one would yeah, want to I be th- involved with the club. Yeah, <laughs> it was just one of those things where they've established themselves as one, as one of the b- better teams in League One now. So I think they they've steadied the ship a little bit from what was mm. going on before. And where, like we said, 
it, it's the culture. Um, if you got a losing mentality where you've got a club that um, has a room which no one really knows what the use of it for is and they kind of just disregard it mm. and you think some kind of um, senior management would walk by it and be like, well, what is that room? What are we using it for? And just question <laughs> a few people. Yeah. It, it would escalate, but it wasn't like that. So that culture there is just horrific and I dread to think what it is like, you know, in in actually being there and working there because you look at in that documentary the people who work there they don't look enthusiastic whatsoever no they look like they want to slip their wrists going into that building <laughs> absolutely and knowing knowing how it how the wages are in league one right their life wouldn't be particularly great and i've i've been in those situations where you've had shitty managers um who are just dicks to you and you you don't want to do anything for them you don't you you don't want to be proactive and helpful at all. You think, okay, I'm just going to get in. I'm going to do the th- do the thing. I'm not going to do it particularly well because I'm not particularly enthusiastic because mm-hmm. my manager's an ass, and I'm just going to get in, do this thing, up until five o'clock, and then I'm going to go home, and I'm just going to procrastinate. I'm not going to be proactive. I'm not going to w- work to find solutions to things, to problems, which, you know, is a big, is a big part of, um, what people do, no matter what mm-hmm. role they're, they're in, like this, we had to s- spend time setting this up, I wouldn't do it if I didn't care. No, that's true. So, you, you It's get, the little things that you, that you take for granted almost that you and do. And they stack up. Yeah. After a and while. And it really shows. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Uh, again, I'm sure if they got paid a little bit better, um, that would be, um, something to It would help. Them. But yeah, it's not. It's not a thing. I, I don't remember whose theory it was, but they're saying that money doesn't actually equate to happiness. It's the um, uh, progress that you can have in work, the development that you've got, and all that mm. sort of stuff. But when you when you work for a club like Sunderland, um, and I'm not saying they're a shit club. I'm just saying they haven't had the best of luck with owners. They haven't had the best of luck with their leadership. So um, maybe the employees are just there to um, for their living, just you know, bring some money home and survive because that's mm. what unfortunately that part of the world really is it's just survival well that's what it's like for most people it's, it's just about getting by and then after a certain point it's about you know once you've got bills paid and things finding something that you actually care about that you care about doing and you know you would hope that um, working for a football club is kind of that next step once you've got everything paid for mm-hmm. so you know what I'm trying to say is that you, you, you would kind of hope that there would be a bit more effort put in by the people at the top to make sure it's a good work culture before, you know, to make sure that the people are actually willing to be productive. Because if you don't like someone, you're not going to do well for them. You're not going to work hard for them. No, but as a footballer, if you look at it, their careers are basically based on their performance, aren't they? Yeah, if yeah. You play, if you play well, then you'll go and be signed by a better club. I think that should be enough as an incentive to go and play. Oh, I was talking like about that. like em- employees, like backroom right, people. Right, okay. But as, as players, absolutely, you should be wanting to play well week in, week out. Mm-hmm. Unless, well, no, you should be wanting to play well week in, week out. Otherwise, why are you there? Yeah. Especially when your career is so short, you want to earn as much money as you can in that, you know, 10, 15 years that most footballers really have up in their That's I was doing say well. peak. But I was going to say five years is probably. I, I suspect mm. the the average career of a footballer is a lot shorter than we actually think it is. Yeah. Because in the in the Premier League is obviously those guys can do well for quite a long time, and if you're not Premier League standard anymore, you can go and play in the Championship. Whereas Sunderland are now in League One. If they're not doing well in League One, okay, they'll go to League Two. What happens once they get a bit older and they're still struggling in League Two? That and that could be towards the age of 30 and you could go off a cliff and you're like oh great I haven't earned much money from this so Mm. where do I go well I think what we're talking about earning a lot of money is really championship um, and Premier League levels League One I don't think they really you know I think a player at at the top club in League One a star player would be on had to push maybe 10 grand a week you know, that's a I proper think that, star I think player. that's pushing it. And yeah. I, I, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to be um, saying things that I shouldn't be saying, but um, I've worked for a League Two club for a little bit as um, mm. one of the one of the marketing 
people throughout my uni placements and I was quite lucky to have a conversation with one of their players, which I'm not going to name of course, mm. but he let me know how much his salary was. Mm. And being a player for a League 2 team that, you know, Crawley, Town aren't um, comfortable in League 2, they're, they're always 15, mm. 12, you know, at best, so they're, they're struggling in League 2 you could say. And his salary was thirty six grand a year. Mm. Now, thirty six grand a year is probably enough um, for someone whose career is going to be forty years long. Yeah. Fifty years long. For someone whose career is probably going to be ten years max. Mm. That's quite worrying. What's he going to do when when he can't run around for ninety minutes anymore? Exactly. Like he's going to have to, and and I suspect he'll probably end up falling into coaching because that seems to be what a lot of former professionals do. Or punditry, if you're high enough football. Yeah. I mean, Robbie Savage is a pundit, so <laughs> everyone's got hope. Exactly, right? If Robbie Savage can do it, then we've got, then there's then there's hope for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's he won? Oh, he, he won like... Or like that. Yeah, he, he, won, he won like some youth um, cup thing when, when he was a youth Came player. on as a sub in the 90th minute and he won it. <laughs> <laughs> And he got his winner's medal. Nice one, Robbie. You played a really important role there. Keeping the bench warm for the sub. You wasted 30 seconds of that game. <laughs> hey, that's a big thing. That's is, a big thing is. in some games. It is. It is. You're right. But um, where, are we, where are we going? Oh, yeah, we were talking about certain players' wages. Yeah, so like, if he doesn't want to go into coaching, what, what does he do after that? Well, you've had a lot of, um, I say a lot, you've had um, the likes of Juan Massa and I know Aspilicueta is doing it, um, where they're doing like leadership degrees at universities. Mm. And uh, again, is, is that the sort of stepping stone, maybe not coaching and such, but where Petr Cech's gone into, into straight into like management and, you know, scouting and um, being that kind of, uh, what's his role, was it technical advisor or something like that, where it doesn't matter but it essentially he's part of the scouting team which mm. helps bring in p people in so um, going to that senior management type of role uh, but it's who you know isn't it it doesn't Always. matter with if you look at um, the players who've gotten there Ryan Giggs um, his first managerial role was Man United and yeah. would he have done that had he not been a Man United player for like 15 years at the top level no and you look at um, his role now with Wales it's the same thing yeah. Lampard wouldn't have gotten um, his derby role if he didn't know, um, of course, Harry Redknapp's his cousin or uncle or whatever is family related. Mm. Um, he was in really good relations with a derby owner. Mm. It's who you know, and football is very much of an industry of, oh, yeah, I had this player play for me. I'm going to call his agent up and see if, you know, what his situation is and whatnot. Um, it's very rarely you go out and do things um, in a very formal way like going out and buying a player from um, Spain that you've never been across but you like the way they play so you're going to buy them mm. when you look at it you know it might be a, it might be a more dated thing but Harry Redknapp buying the same load of players all the time you, you've had Peter Crouch Defoe Cranshaw Shaw yeah. Luca you know, all those players why because he knew them and it, it is rarer nowadays don't get me wrong yeah. but it's still a thing and when you've got Lampard who's just come in um, and all of his backroom staff which he, worked with him and um, at Chelsea under 18s when he was the assistant to Jody Morris um, they've come in and yeah it's about who you know and uh, well that's the same for any industry to be fair I think it really shows from my experience it, yeah it, it really shows in football oh yeah it massively shows up in football but you you also see it in things like finance for example where certain people like I, I, I could have, if I wanted to, I could have gone into some kind of finance role because my dad works in finance, so it would have been quite easy to get that kind of job. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really want to because it's not what I wanted to do, but you see the point. Yeah. And I'm sure you would have been able to get places because of what where your dad does, uh, where, where your dad works and things. So it's the, same, it's the same for a lot of people. And, you know, I don't, I don't begrudge them necessarily for taking advantage of that because why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. I think you'd be quite silly to not take advantage of those types of, of those types of things that are just given to you. Um, yeah, so it, it's just the way it's just the way it works, really. Yeah, maybe I'm being a bit salty about it because <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get to where you wanted to get. Yeah, I was overlooked a few times, but I'm not getting into that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we all get. It just is what it is, really. It's part of it. 